It's the Almost Perfect Podcast. Welcome to the Almost Perfect Podcast, a celebration of fuck-ups, failures, and falling flat on your face. This is a podcast that believes you can learn from experience, but that experience doesn't have to be your own. Ha, I'm Bob Perfect, and I'm a functional fuck-up. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes. And today we're learning from Kevin Gus Ross. Now, Kevin is a photographer who got his start in the mosh pits of Durban and is now a creative director over in Dublin. So he's doing all right for himself. He's uh, had quite a journey from being a young goth who used to be hired to shoot dicks and drugs. And uh, yeah, I think that's why he moved overseas because <laughs> that, that, that's, he, he became known for being the guy who captures the debauchery or as he puts it, he got too comfortable in Durban. And so he moved overseas to try and challenge himself a bit more. I think the truth probably lies somewhere somewhere in the middle there. And <laughs> you'll find out for yourself as we chat on this podcast. This one is uh, a nostalgic one in a lot of ways. We chat so much about the good old days and just how much fun like the alternative scene in Durban was and just how crazy it was and just how egos used to clash up against each other and just the chaos and manicness of a certain time period and certain places in Durban's history. So if you, you know, if you're, if you're a young'un or you're not from Durban, I think this really gives you like a pretty cool snapshot. Yeah, yeah, I meant it. You know I meant it. Uh, a snapshot <laughs> into like that time period in Durban and I had so much fun in this conversation you'll hear it's like Kevin and I are just laughing most of the way through we're just cracking jokes we're just being real with each other as well and just yeah man this one this one I'm I'm super super happy with and I can't wait for you to hear it. If you know Kevin, or even if you don't know Kevin, I think you're going to get a lot out of this. And especially not just the history of, you know, the alternative scene in Durban for like that specific period, because Kevin got there kind of towards the end, kind of in the middle, like the late middle period. I don't know. Like, yeah, he wasn't there for the whole thing. He wasn't there for old Burn. He was only there since new Burn. But the stuff that he captured and the scenes he was a part of and <laughs> the trips he went on, and the photos he captured were, you know, uh, like, I don't know, in, the, in a weird way, like, they're iconic, but I don't know if I can say that because not the entire world knows, but if you're a Durbanite, like, Kevin's definitely one of the more iconic photographers for that time period. And yeah, man, I, I love that I got to talk about photography so much on this podcast because it is my first love. Like, I, I actually worked on a Photoshop from the age of 16 to 21 when a one-hour Photoshop, yeah, I used to process and develop your spools, you, you old fogies who used to come in with your, your snapshots of your shitty bras with your friends. Uh, man, I think, yeah, it wasn't my first titty, but I saw some titties <laughs> people used to do that was the funniest thing i was 16 years old and people sometimes used to hand me spools with their naughty photos on and yeah we checked those people obviously we had to because if you saw anything illegal or child pornographic um not that i ever did but yeah you would have to report it so and also just for quality control so yes if you ever handed a spool over to someone in a one hour photoshop and you wondered did they look at my photos yes they had to it's part of the job so there's a little bit of info for you uh but yeah like, i love i love photography it's not something i do much anymore because i date a wonderful photographer and even back in the day with durban is yours like russell grant and i used to we're all everywhere together and he's a he's a good shooter so yeah the as much as like in my youth man i just remember like glennie friedman i don't know if you guys know who he is but he was a photographer in the new york punk punk and hardcore and hip-hop scene and skate scenes back in the day his stuff is just it was so inspiring and like it really I, early on in my life, wanted to be like Lenny Friedman. And then, you know, with reading Blunt Magazine, you see guys like Liam Lynch, who we discuss here. We also, Tyron Bradley comes up quite a lot. We didn't really mention Barry Tuck, but he was also quite influential in that 
time period and just getting you know the shots of what was happening in the counterculture or the underground culture here in South Africa with through regards to like skateboarding and BMX and stuff like that so yeah we we get into all of that we get into different cameras and just lighting conditions and it's there's yeah so there's some technical talk when it comes to photography there's nostalgic talk there's just dope stories about interesting characters so i think you're gonna enjoy this i really really do i had so much fun in it i think i've mentioned that i think i've mentioned that i've had a had a lot of fun on this podcast and i think you are going to too um this is Okay, oh wait, I quickly got to tell you that this is a listener-supported podcast. It means that it's brought to you by you and that you can support it by going to patreon.com forward slash almost perfect. Cool, now that that's out the way, uh, it is the two-year anniversary of the Almost Perfect podcast. I, well, almost. In 24 hours from when I am speaking to you, it will be the two-year anniversary of the Almost Perfect podcast. Put out the first episode on the 12th of September 2018, and uh, here we are. 75 episodes later with three or four bonus episodes <laughs> so almost 80 almost 80 or it probably is 80 i don't actually know how many i've done exactly but yeah man it's been such a fucking cool journey it's been a roller coaster as i say fairly often <laughs> should probably try and find something else to put there but what else can, can you say when things go up and down and up and down and up and down I mean, it depends if... No, no. I was going to make a sex joke there, and then... Why, why are we doing that? Why, why are we going to go there? Eh, what was I saying? To your anniversary of the Almost Perfect podcast. It's... Really has just been the most wonderful fucking experience and journey, and... I am eternally grateful that you're listening to this right now. And some of you are subscribers on Patreon... And you're actually giving me money for this. And that is... Oh, man. That, that, I don't even know how to describe what that is to me. Because with Durban is yours, you know, like, I did so much for so long for so little. And I really thought that one day it would, it would work. But I never could make it work. And this is kind of working. Like, I'm not covering my, all my, like, my personal expenses, but I'm doing a lot with the money I get from this, you know, just in terms of marketing budget for this, just in terms of getting equipment, just in terms of saving up to get various other things that I need uh, for it. You know, we've got merch made in terms of, in terms of, why do I keep saying in terms of? Is this because of all the Alan Watts I've been watching? Is that it? I haven't even watched them, like, lately, so I don't know. But, yeah, just... <laughs> It's unreal. It really is. And I get so many cool responses to this. I just... And I've learned so fucking much. That's the thing that I really appreciate about this. Is that each of these conversations that I have with people, I get so much out of it. It's not just that you hopefully get something out of this. It's that I get to ask questions that I want to know the answers to with people who I want to know or who I want to ask questions you know, like, that is fun, that's cool, that's rad, like, it's so dope to have that access, and to have people who trust me enough to be able to tell their stories on this podcast, so, I'm, yeah, just, I'm digging it, I'm having a good time, I'm feeling good, it's been a good week, it's been a good couple weeks lately, actually, I've been in a good headspace, and life isn't too shitty for me at the moment, so, yeah man i'm just i'm just stoked so thank you thank you genuinely for supporting this for listening to this and just being a part of it over the last two years i'm really looking forward to seeing it grow i don't intend on stopping and i do feel like i've gotten pretty fucking good at this in some ways i might be tooting my horn a little bit there but i would hope that after two years of doing this thing i've got a decent understanding of how to make it good or at least better than it was because yo don't, don't go back and listen to the early episodes please don't do that but please do go back and listen to like the last 10 or 20 at least i think i think my skills have gotten better as a host <laughs> over the last two years and if they didn't then i would need to fucking quit Ugh, so what else do i need to tell you i've got some notes here i've got some notes in front of me 
Oh, I think I said that the print room don't do film, and I think they actually do at their Kloof branch. So hit them up if you if you are looking to get film printed. Uh, that might not make sense right now, but later in the conversation you'll get what I mean. Uh, what else? I spent this weekend, this last weekend, doing the DFM, the Durban Film Mart. I got to host six panel discussions, and fuck, it was so cool. I got to learn so much about the film industry. I mean, I've done the DFM, this is my second year being a panelist, well not a panelist, a moderator for the panels, and what a what a dope job, man, and what a, <laughs> what a cool experience. I'm so grateful that Tiny and Mitch, who you can who you can uh, hear from yourself on this podcast. Just go back to some of the previous episodes, Tani Mungwe and Mitchell Harper. I'm so grateful that they got me on board for this year's DFM because it was a digital edition. And through Almost Live and through doing this, I feel like I've picked up a fairly decent skill set and was able to do a good job in moderating these panels and in, in being, keeping them engaging, keeping them flowing and just asking good questions. And so I learned a hell of a lot this last week and I'm getting paid for it, which is amazing. Like that's, uh, that's cool. Like you see, you see why I'm saying like life's been good for me at the moment. I've been doing things that I enjoy. I've been learning so much. I've been interacting with people who are doing sick things and just like, yeah. One more <laughs> compared to all the isolation, compared to all the insecurity and just the yeah the, all the doubts that I've had over the last six months I think or whatever, it's really it's really cool to be feeling good again and it's really cool to be getting to do all these amazing things. I'm actually going to be hosting uh, the DFM Awards this Sunday at 3 p.m. So that's going to be fun. From from my house, I'm going to be doing that. And also, I've been asked to commentate for the MTG section at Comic-Con this year. Last year, I was the host of that section for the Josie Comic-Con, and I had so much fun. I had so much fun that I actually won the tournament, <laughs> which was uh, not really that surprising. I'm pretty fucking good at it. But now I have to now I have to defend my title whilst also commentating. So it's going to be an interesting thing. I'll share links when they are relevant. You will probably be able to watch on Twitch or maybe not. I don't know. I'm not too sure where it'll be streaming. It'll be probably on the Comic Con app maybe. And you should also enter that if you're a Magic player. Go check out what is it? <laughs> See, I didn't have notes for that, but just go to Comic Con Africa, check out the MTG side of things, and enter into it. There's a five grand first prize, so that's going to be sick for me. And uh, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you can get famous by me beating you in the finals whilst I commentate. So I'm just going to be shit talking you the whole time, oh, and everyone's going to get to hear it. This is going to be fun. See what? I ah, I'm just having the most fun. And then what else? We've also got the Super Delinquent Squad. This is a cartoon that myself and Sheldon Bankston have been working on this year. We've got Kayla Archer's been doing the character designs and she's absolutely killing it. And we've got the pilot written, we've fleshed it out, we're pretty stoked about it. We've made a little animatic for that. And we've now got some voice actors on board who are going to be lending their voices to the animatic so we can try and sell it. So we're, we're moving along steadily at a rapid pace. And I'm hoping we can get this cartoon made. And <laughs> I'm just letting you know about it now because maybe, maybe we'll have to crowdfund it down the road. But we're hoping to get, we've got some producers who are interested. We've been chatting to various different studios to get it made. So, you know, there's, I don't know, probably like a 30% chance it's going to get made at the moment. And that's not the best odds, but probably also way more than they actually are like it's probably like a 10 percent chance of getting made but i'm still excited i'm still i'm not gonna get too ahead of myself but it's been a wonderful experience just being a part of it from this side and the dfm also just inspired me a lot and i've i've already got a short film that i've written that's in the can well the first edit the first drafts there so i need to i need to rewrite it for the next couple of weeks and then, yeah, I want to work on that. So I want to make a short film for next year's diff slash DFM and see, see what can happen with that. So that brings us to the shout outs section of this introduction. 
And this is because on patreon.com forward slash almost perfect, there is a tier. It is called the titular titles tier. And that is because you get to pick a title to be shouted out on this podcast. You get to become a part of the cast and crew. And you are the reason why I say we instead of I when I talk about the podcast. Even though I'm the one technically putting on all the work and you're the ones paying me. Somehow you are my employees of the almost perfect podcast. So firstly, shout out to Karan Slemon, who is the almost perfect youth group leader. Super important job that. Thank you for getting the youth involved, Karan. Uh, to be honest with you, the stats are still a little low. We're, we're still in that uh, 20, 24 and up category. So I don't know. I don't know what you're doing, bro, but maybe, maybe try and find some younger people, please. I need that 18 and up demographic. I don't know why they don't have any money, and but somehow that's that's what everyone wants. Um, I, as you can tell, I know fuck all about marketing. Uh, Chief Sales Officer, Officer? No, Chief Sales Officer of Subtle Heresies in the Greater Overberg Region, Rousseau. Shout outs to you. Keep uh, spreading those Subtle Heresies. Big fan of your work. And then shout outs to King Julian. Shout outs as well to His Excellency, President for Life, Field Marshal, Stephen Olafia, VC, DSO, MC, Lord of all the beasts of the earth and fishes of the seas and conqueror of the British Empire in Africa in general and certain parts of KwaZulu Natal in particular, or something slightly less pretentious like executive producer. You see, you, you give me $10 a month, see what you get, see what you get, see what you get. And then lastly, we have got Vishendra Naidu, who is my spiritual advisor. And Vishendra has definitely been putting in extra work this year. He is on form. I am feeling fucking enlightened. You must know. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Jim Carrey this shit sometime. I'm gonna be on that next plane. I'm not gonna quite Russell Brand it. Definitely, definitely don't want to Russell Brand it. But we can Jim Carrey it. We can, we can get there. I think that would be the level of quackery I want to get to when it comes to being zen. Because there's definitely a level of quackery when it comes to being zen. Um, that's it. That's a long as fuck intro. Oh, oh no. Shit. I got one more thing to say. We have got mugs. We have got almost perfect mugs that you can buy if you want to support the podcast. They are 100 rand each. And 10 rand from each sale goes to Sasonke. Sasonke is an organization by sex workers for sex workers that is working to decriminalize sex work in south africa as well as providing support to south african sex workers so you can check them out to sonke.org.za and you can also just buy a mug from me for 100 bucks like i say i'll swing 10 rand to them from each mug sale and that's it that that i'm pretty certain is everything i need to tell you so without further ado here comes the almost perfect podcast with Kevin Goss Ross. Cool. So how are you living, Kevin? Well, I suppose, Bob, just like the rest of the world, I'm living in a dystopian nightmare where I'm not allowed to hug anyone. Fair so enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you at least adhering to the not hugging people? Because in South Africa, I don't know, the social distancing seems to be over. Oh, does it feel very much like everyone's just gone, fuck it, like we're lockdown level two, we can do whatever we want? Yeah, like I live on Hill and Joseph Road and I just, I went to the shops now to get some food and yeah, it, we, we're not, it's, you know, it's February here. <laughs> <laughs> we, corona hasn't hit, so oh, well, well, it seems that way. Yeah, no, I mean, like for the most part, people here are kind of, are kind of respecting it. Um I don't know. I just find it hard. I think that's that the hugging. I'm a huggy man, you know. You are. Uh, yes, it's just I remember. It's my nature. Yeah. Uh, but like the pubs being, most of the pubs are still closed, so um, that helps. Uh, I suppose we, you guys had your massive alcohol ban prohibition, mm. which isn't. <laughs> I don't know if it would work here. Is it even possible? Like uh, from what I understand about Ireland, like that drinking culture is above ours, even. I don't know. I, it's hard to tell. It's hard to say. Um, they're certainly enthusiastic. Uh, <laughs> one of the first things that happened here was um, the pub started uh, doing takeaway pints of Guinness, where Ooh, they they bring nice. it or or like delivery, which was brilliant. So the little truck would come down like a, an ice cream van for grown-ups. Yeah, I saw some social media of some 
like restaurants and bars doing that during vibes here, you know, like in the in the stories and stuff like that. I don't think they were legally allowed to, but I saw some people getting some takeaway beers. And that's, you know, that that, that I can deal with. That I think is all right as long as, you know, you keep your two-meter distance and your line, then this should be okay. A hundred percent, yeah. Look, I think, I think a lot of the... Um, as as long as you're being fucking sensible, you know? Like, I feel like here people do respect it uh, more than I would have thought. I, I thought initially Ireland's handling initially was a little, like, chill. What was it like? Because I know England, like, were just like, yeah, whatever, herd immunity. And then they were like, nah, not herd immunity. And things have just been chaos there. But Ireland's a bit different. Yeah, no, geez, thank fuck. No, it was just kind of like, it was, a, it was a very Irish response to it initially. At, at first, when people saw that it was like a real threat, I remember there were pictures circulating at Dublin Airport of two people um, at arrivals at a trestle table with like pamphlets. And that was it. <laughs> it's like, lads, come on. <laughs> just like a little, can we just be a little bit more scared? Just for now. It honestly seems like a movie, you know, like a comedy, like a, a comedy, like a Dylan, uh, Dylan Moran, like almost like if he had to yeah. write like a comedy, that would be a scene like in a, just like this airport, like open, like a wide shot, basically, of these two dudes like sitting at a table, like and you get off the <laughs> plane and there they are. Yeah, it's like there's this disease that's good, that might kill everyone, but we've got some information in the form of a printed pamphlet. Welcome to Dublin. <laughs> but it's been handled very well since. Like I feel like um, I feel I feel quite safe here. There's a, 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 sp- a spike now, but I think that's going to happen everywhere, you know? Yeah, as things open up, it is just natural that that's going to happen. And we all yeah, just have to do our best to be careful. Uh, why did you move to Ireland? Because uh, that, that, let's just start there. I was going to start, we could go all the way back, but we'll, we'll work, work our way back from why did you move to Ireland? You, you used to be a bit of a Durban boy, although you weren't the proudest of Durban boys. You weren't <laughs> like one of these people who was like, you know, do, like I'm going to do everything for this city. Like I remember we did an interview for Durban is yours years ago and you're like, just go weird. Like, you know, it makes you happy. <laughs> well, like the thing is, I've never really lived anywhere very long. So as much as as much as I lived in Durban for my studies and then a couple of years after, like I'm not an actual Durbanite. So I was born in Pretoria. Fair enough, yeah. Yeah, I lived in Katu in the Northern Cape and then like lived in Tunzini, which is, you know, up the coast from you guys. So when I lived, I lived in Durban for a bit and I loved it. Like I loved the city. I love, I love the pub. I love the people. But then, I don't know, man, like it, everything was going too well. And, and I'm a <laughs> fan of like sabotaging myself. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, the band Tool. And they've, it's, um, they've got a lyric that says, you know, whatever will bewilder me. So I kind of live by that. Uh, and I just remember being like, OK, things are going well. Uh, I've got a career. Let's ruin that by moving <laughs> to Ireland in the middle of one of the worst recessions in history uh, when Ireland was especially badly hit. Ireland was kind of just like a place that I'd been for 10 days back in 2006 when I was uh, 19. I was just here for 10 days and, and I remember the people being very friendly. I remember the city being, Dublin especially, being quite small, which I enjoyed because I lived in London. London was like, it's, it's very hard to get your head around that city or get into it. But uh, the city of Dublin, I just fell in love with even in, in those 10 days. And I also remember that the locals in Dublin, the, the couple I met, had a very similar sense of humor to uh, what we have in South Africa. And sort of like, if you were trying to do creative work, in my opinion, if you don't get the sense of humor, you're shit out of luck. This is not going to work out for you. Um, yeah, the cracking of jokes on set in in the office, all of it. It's like, yeah, it's part of culture. You've got to be able to connect with the other people. Of course, yeah, yeah, of course. And and just like if you're like, I'm in I'm in advertising now. You know, like if you <laughs> if you don't understand the humor, you're not gonna sell anything to anyone. Did you ever yeah. see yourself in advertising like ten years ago? Oh, man, I don't I don't know where I saw myself ten years ago. <laughs> I was I was a confused little goth. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why I ask, because, like, I remember you being, like, a bit of a misanthropic, you know, anti, 
establishment kind of guy and like it was the thing of you had a career in Durban and in photography which is like the craziest thing you know like to be able to make happen and then to give it up to go to Ireland and then get into advertising it seems like a strange path almost uh, yeah look I think I don't think there's a, a, a single path for anyone in the creative field anymore um no <laughs> but it, it's actually that's another reason man like I remember I used to I used to go to uh, to agencies in in Durban in South Africa, and uh, they always knew me as the guy who took pictures of you know drunk punks and <laughs> and like dicks, like yep. literally there was just like a lot of dick in my work, back from the Mahala days, you know, dicks and drugs. I remember well, at one point, was that what you were hired for here? No, that that's yeah exactly. So like no one wanted me to do anything else. And when I got anything, any like proper briefs that were outside of that, like I remember the one brief literally said like no dicks, no drugs. And I was like, for fuck's mm-hmm. sake, I've tarnished my name. Uh, so like, when I came here, like, and, thank you. At least now I could like expand my range a little bit. <laughs> yeah, 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 basically. But when I came here, no, no one knew who I was. So it was kind of it was a good thing. That's yeah, that's something I'm thinking about a lot these days, you know, just going somewhere where, you know, I'm not a person who people know, (laughs) you know, and you get to, you get to like, yeah, just reimagine yourself essentially and also meet new people. And, and have you, how have you found the impact for yourself? Like I can imagine just upheaval moving to an entirely new country and yeah, what happened? Yeah. Like, um, I think it's good for you. I think if, if the opportunity to try live somewhere else, even if it's just for a bit, I think it's it's endlessly beneficial to anyone, you know? Like, um, I suppose the, the hardest part of it was obviously, like, well, money was the problem because it didn't yeah. earn a whole bunch. Like, I, I did okay in South Africa, but I mean, like, it was like three years worth of savings uh, that were gone, like just gone in three months. There was a point where, like, I moved over with um, Sarah Cummins. Uh, yeah. uh, we were together at that point. And uh, I think there was a point where we had 40 euro with no real um, hope of other money. Like, <laughs> I was also, it was kind of weird. Like, we got here um, uh, and and I, I'm Afrikaans. And um, when you kind of trace back my genealogy, it goes back very far it's almost like we were on one of the first ships over you know there's just there's no ancestral bullshit like a lot of people are just like you know i'll move to the uk because my granny was born there or whatever yeah so the first seven months i wasn't allowed to work i was just waiting for a fucking visa uh and then i only became an irish citizen like this year uh so in terms of like it was exceptionally difficult i remember what back made in the you day take that risk though because did you know you were going to have to wait that long for the visa or like what was the situation there i didn't know i didn't i didn't know much man you know i was <laughs> i was just ready for an adventure i'd moved like as i said i'd moved to a different country before and that it, it's kind of like um it it really was that the yearning for just like trying something different that scared me because like, things were like, as I was saying, man, things were just going really well, um, and I do like to self sabotage. And um, it's almost like you know when you're like you wouldn't know. You have you ever had like a full time job? Um, it's, yeah, like a couple times. Like when for like back in the day. Yeah, I, I did. I you I worked for uh, Garlic and Bassfield. Weirdly enough, uh, were the ones who sent me a lawyer's letter from Splashy. Uh, but I worked for them for like a month. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, yeah, I worked also, I worked retail. I did uh, Revolution. I used yeah. to do like five, six days a week there, like eight hour days there. I've done, you know, restaurants and stuff like that, although that's not really full time employment. Yeah. But, but, but I've also. So you, you yeah, understand, you understand the like in the nine to five grind, right? Like, or. Yeah, or, like, I've been there. So my so, early twenties were full of it. <laughs> I I didn't have any of it until I moved here. But um, you know how it's like how how if you you're in a rhythm, it's almost like your life just passes by. Like if you've got if you've got a a, a very set routine and way of doing things, it almost feels like life passes you by way quicker. It's almost like time just fucks off. But if you've got a, a really tough year, that year kind of feels like it's gone in a second, and 
and uh, like i i always feel like if you if you want Wait, really yeah Are you like so i mean but obviously like living through it's pretty excruciating isn't it sorry no um that was the wrong way around sorry. okay cool yeah i thought yeah. so yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, if, if you're if you're living through tough times, it takes it feels longer. That's that's where I was going with that. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, <laughs> <No worries. laughs> so it takes longer, and it's almost, it's almost like you extend your life by putting yourself through hardship. There's just more <laughs> like reference. I've points. never heard it put that way. No, it's like there's more reference points. It's kind of like keyframes in your life to to go down like a video route. It's like the, oh, I the remember book of your happened. stories, like the book of your life, is gonna just have way more chapters on it. Exactly, yeah. So that was kind of another reason. I don't know. I was just bored, man, you know? <laughs> and you've always had a bit of a heart of adventure. Yeah, well, I don't like making things easy for myself. I mean, even just your South African photography, I remember you were one of those people, like, didn't you just hop on a train with people at one point? And, like, like you've gone on, like, a lot of trips and just, yeah, like, found yourself in some interesting situations, right? Yeah, well, like, that was all um, working for Mahala back in the day. Do you remember them? Yes, I remember Mahalo, of course, old Andy Davis's thing. Uh, who else was there? There was obviously Roger Young. It was, yeah, it was a deep catalog of yeah. people that worked for Mahalo back in the day. Sweatface. Oh, Pachanga. yes. <laughs> Pachanga. Yeah, Pachanga, Pachanga and I have a little issue that we still need to resolve from like Opikopi a few years ago. He, oh. he got very upset with me over something I wrote. But maybe, maybe one day he'll be on the podcast and we'll, we'll resolve it. We'll see. Then I remember there were times where Creepy Steve used to write for Mahala. So like, you know, <laughs> so I was like, I must have been my first year of college or second year of college when I started working with Mahala, you know, and obviously the joke was always like, well, they used to say it was called Mahala because the magazine was free, but we used to say it's Mahala because we work for free. Yep. Um, I, I wrote for Mahala once or twice. <laughs> and that, there was only once or twice for a reason. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. I mean, like, sometimes they cover, they'd cover our expenses, but... It's probably you know, more than I ever gave you for DIY. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I never had to get on a train with Roger Young and Sweatface uh, oh to, to fucking... What, what was it called? Rampus. Yeah. Oh, like, snap. Was that the train thing? That was the, yeah. the train trip. Your, yeah, there were a couple please of Please tell me about that. Uh, it was um, Hank van der Skyf. Uh, yes <laughs> he's going to be on this podcast one day as well he's he? someone who's been on the list for a while yeah i'm oh keen my God. i i love that man he wants he wants nearly wanted to take me out because i called him a hans Vos, but uh that's a different <laughs> story <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a long story but basically what happened there is just uh we wanted to cover Ramfest. um hank had this train trip this train that he had booked where it was basically just musicians and like media and a couple more people uh the train was going to go from johannesburg to cape town and then ramfest you know so i think we took a train up to it was called hotbox so the hotbox yeah, train. Hotbo the hotbox express yeah yes they, they had great t-shirts it said the snora van sietu <laughs> <laughs> but it was like it was absolute fucking carnage i don't know how hank pulled it off they basically just like booked two train two cars on the back of the train and uh it was it was fucking brilliant but i was in a cabin with roger young Sweatface, and hank um, <laughs> and they all joel like i oh my God. Joled with all three of those people and you know i'm kind of grateful i don't anymore I'll just put it that way. <laughs> like, I think I think uh, Sweatface and Hank are both um, yeah you know, have chilled out a little bit. Uh, I just remember I have I have weird memories of like trying to go to sleep on this train. I have memories of Sweatface throwing a bottle of uh, of Black Label into my sleeping bag uh, <laughs> after he had shaken it because I tried to sleep. I remember um, cheesecake. Someone bought cheesecake and it was all over the roof. And it, I remember it like leaving that fucking that little our little cabin, and uh, the door. So don't lie. That's why you left. Like that's why you left. <laughs> <South Africa. laughs> well, when I left, I was living in Creepy Steve's the Kaya. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So you no, you'd been living. Cool. You'd been living. Cool. Like it was really. I was doing all that stuff not because 
for any reason except that I enjoyed it and I, I really enjoyed the culture and I loved I love music I still obviously I still love music but like I just have no aptitude for it I'm a purely visual I being the feeling yeah so I just wanted to be involved in that scene whichever way I could uh, and I was like studying so I was like fucking this is a way this is a way to just be involved in the scene and make some sort of name for myself i didn't know that the name would just be you know kevin gostros cock photographer <laughs> <laughs> you developed a style pretty early on though uh had you but you you've been an artist for most of your life i know you come from an artistic family right yeah yeah well i'm i'm lucky in that way um my mom is a multifaceted creative she does absolutely everything she does uh one day she'll be doing chemical etching where you put chemicals on a on metal and you need the further it it etches it kind of eats away at the metal the more ink sinks in so you kind of draw with acid <laughs> uh, my and then she she also does photography landscape mostly she paints and anything that makes a mark it's brilliant my dad is one of the most creative people i've met he's he's an engineer type but um his brain just works in a completely different way to anyone's i've ever met and then my brother um who i think a lot of people will know Wagner is yeah he's an absolutely brilliant designer and artist you know i think i think my, him and my mom are in many ways way more like artistic than i am okay um, yeah no definitely and and so prolific i feel incredibly lazy when it uh, <laughs> whenever i'm around them or see what they're doing like also uh, my gran paints all the time her her sister painted all the time and like from a very early age i've got memories of like painting really bad like watercolors of dinosaurs or something when I, was I mean same i just never took it forward <laughs> yeah. yeah and i just remember my my grand telling my mom no you have to you have to nurture this and my mom going yeah well obviously so, <laughs> i don't know thank thank fuck for them otherwise who knows what i'd be doing so when did you start taking photos when was that start, when did that start becoming a passion of yours i was studying graphic design at DUT, which was absolutely brilliant, uh, just like yeah, that was that from course. what I understand was a great course, a brilliant course. It's still going. Dane Nutson is teaching there now too, which is he's obviously an incredible creative and an artist. So I was studying graphic design and it was cool and I I liked it, and then because I wanted to be an illustrator, that was that was my whole thing. And at and one you point, saw your brother's work and you were like, hey, maybe maybe I should do something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he knows, he knows what's up, let leave him to do it. No, it was kind of just like, uh, I needed to, I was drawing obviously by hand, uh, and then I needed to, I didn't have like a Wacom tablet or anything, and I needed to take the drawings into the computer, and there was this weird moment where I could have bought a scanner to do that, or like for a bit more money, at the time it was like the first SLRs, digital SLRs were coming out for pretty cheap, so I was like, scanner, camera, so I went for the camera, and and it's just the 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 really like organic nature of it uh, really got to me. And also, just I'm a child, so you know, <laughs> drawing something for eight hours and then you know having one thing or just taking a picture and it's fucking there. The immediacy of it bit me really hard. So it was kind of by accident, to be honest. Uh, snap. Yeah, like uh, I mean, I to be honest, also I, I wasn't a very like gifted illustrator. But I, I enjoyed it and graphic design is, is cool and it's um, I enjoy I still do it like a little bit. It's very, you know, it's very grid. It's very like vector. There's strong mm -hmm. lines. There's this has to line up with this and and photography. There, it's, there's a lot of chaos in it and, and it's a very organic thing that and, and I really like that. It's really like I'm a, I'm a kind of a pixel person, you know? Uh, okay. Yeah, it, it's weird. It's hard to explain, but. There's a, yeah, the organic nature of photography is what appealed to me and the instantaneous nature of photography initially. Then, then I became more of a stylized, like heavy lighting photographer, which is what I still do now, which is a lot. I've, I've made my life more difficult doing that. But initially it was just like, you know, running around fucking burn and the Winston with a flash attached to my camera. Uh, I don't remember. But then also, didn't you also have like a external at one stage? No, that wasn't you. An external like, like, flash. like a, a bigger flash, yeah. Oh yeah, well, yeah, I just used yeah. the little speed lights. Um, yeah, that was kind of 
so initially I was just taking pictures of music because as I was saying, I just wanted to be involved in that scene. And there was so much happening at, in Durban at that point. It was like the fucking Bro, renaissance. It's like, I can't, like, I don't, like, I, that's why I, like, I like having people like you on the podcast. And, you know, we, I do have a few people and we rem- reminisce a bit because I don't think people understand what it was really like, you know, that time incredible. period. Yeah, like I listened to the thing you did with Matty uh, from the Winnie and uh, yeah. Luke. I mean, Luke, Luke Mulver. Yeah, because yeah. like I only stumbled, I stumbled into that scene. I was super lucky. I didn't I fuck, I didn't fucking build it. I mean, everyone stumbles into that scene. <laughs> like that's how yeah. it works. You yeah. you just one day find yourself at the fucking Winston. You're like, yeah, this these are my people. This is this is where I should be. A hundred percent. Yeah, it was just like I I initially found Burn. I went in. Yeah. Initially, and I was just like, this is cool. I like metal. Uh, let's do it. And then uh, I took some pictures the one day. I think I took pictures there like three nights. I was super shy about the whole thing. And like, I just wanted to photograph music. And then the one day Delia from Burn just said, hey, I like your pictures. Can you do that for us this night? I'll pay you. Like, it wasn't a lot. It was like 300 rand or something. But um, then I was like, oh, shit. I for the night. Exactly. Uh, you know, I'm going to be there anyway. Uh, so I started doing that a lot. And then she started paying me more <laughs> later on <laughs> when I could actually... When I knew what I was what I was doing, I mean, um, you didn't have any experience at all, and they took you on. Hundred so. <laughs> percent, yeah. No, I'm eternally grateful for them. I mean, it it was just. I mean, I was there anyway. It was brilliant. And then eventually, I found the Winston, and then Burn clothes. But yeah, there was that was a special time. So wait, you you weren't around for Old Burn. You only knew the the Burn that was down by Mgeni Road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm what they call in Ireland a, a blow-in. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of kind of came in and everyone would always say oh the old burn was so much better I'd be like yeah okay cool. I don't know if it was better it was different they were they were different and they had different focuses at times and different ownership like philosophies and yeah like I I loved both at different times and I disliked both at different times if I'm honest so <laughs> yeah that's fair enough yeah yeah but then like so i was just i was doing a lot of that and then um i was talking to raheem uh from trousers on the sea when that was a thing uh and they wanted some like promo photos you know for like media oh i I remember those photos yeah that was like the first time where i was like you know what i'm gonna i'm actually gonna do something chaotic uh this i think it was this is the one it was a typewriter. I don't, remember, I don't know if you remember. Oh, that. okay, no, no, I'm thinking of a different one, but cool. Yeah, yeah, I know it was like, but it was the first time where I was like, you know what, I'm gonna try like set something up that isn't that's still music, but like trying to, trying to like, it's cool, you know, you know when you take too much acid and <laughs> you can you can like hear colors and yes, uh, actually, <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, synesthesia, right. So I was kind of looking for that synesthesia, taking music that I loved and like making it an image. That was like the whole idea initially. Uh, has, but has that gone through a lot of your musical work? Because I can kind of, I can kind of see that. Well, like that's, I mean, it's impossible. But like, yeah, it's impossible to get it correct. But I can see what you're going for. Like, you know, in terms of like your usage of color, in terms of the way you like have people positioned. But I mean, people are also doing their own thing. But like. Your photos do, like, I don't know, I actually feel like I can't hear your photos sometimes. Oh, that's, like, the nicest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> don't, don't, uh, yeah, don't expect more. Okay, that's it. That's, your quote is reached. Yeah, we're 26 uh, minutes in, that's it. <laughs> yeah, like, well, I think, I think initially, that was just the first time where I was, like, not just documenting, it was kind of, like, setting something up and trying to bring that, um, like communicate something else and it's the first time i think i did anything like good in color too because up sure. until that point it was all black and white what was that ah uh, well i think you know punk photography has always been black and white right like all that any leave of it stuff um i mean by necessity but yeah <laughs> yeah by necessity choice. necessity for her but like it's a style that's there also like all of uh, liam lynch's stuff was black and white so you kind of yeah. like and he's obviously the fucking Mac Daddy of this thing. Was he, he was a big influencer for you, hey? I, he was a big influence for anyone taking pictures of music back in the day. Yeah, he worked for Blunt. Like, I remember his photos in Blunt magazine. Yeah, across the board. We're definitely... 
quite inspiring and he wrote quite a bit as well oh of course yeah no well he's obviously he made it he made it a genre like before that the only people you'd see shooting gigs would be you know like the newspaper people yeah I mean, he made it, he kind of made it an art but there is obviously a reason why he was shooting black and white too um he bounces flash same as anyone who would shoot back back in the day because all the clubs were so dark and the sensors the camera sensors weren't great yet so what you do is you bounce the flash into the ceiling and especially the punk in the metal cl clubs would always have purple always or so. red ceilings or black oh, ceilings. Fair. but what happens then is the light bounces off the ceiling and it becomes the color of the ceiling so you'd have all these like kind of purpley photographs do you know what i'm you know what i mean yeah no i know yeah. exactly what you mean so 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 you just shoot black and white because then you so you don't have that get rid of that straight away so that was that was the reason really but yes, it, it also hides, like, sensors used to be so bad on digital cameras. <laughs> like, they were so bad. Like, if you shot over an ISO of, like, 800, it would just it would just be little red dots everywhere. And little red dots having... are way more disgusting than little white dots. Fair enough. I remember having a Lumix LX7 and being so stoked with it because that sensor was so good, like, for the time. And, like, then, like, a few years later, just being like, what What am I even doing? Like, taking photos with this. It's like the information's so bad. But yeah. the technology evolved quite quickly for photography. Quite those, luckily, actually. Yeah, those are those are cool. But that, Yeah, I mean, like, uh, yeah, especially low light has is, is become a lot better, but I, I still yeah. shoot on a very old camera. I don't know. What, I, what do you use? I like I use a 5D Mark II, which I only Still got. a Mark II. Yeah, like is it on the Mark IV now? I don't know. Who gives I a shit? I think so. I, like yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Page is looking at getting a three. So yeah. Yeah, like it's all the same really. Uh, I <laughs> I shot on my 5D Mark One until recently. I think it's great. <laughs> it wow. Yeah, man. It, well, like not commercial work because okay, because yeah, those sensors are a bit like too small at this stage. That's twelve megapixels, I think. <laughs> but uh, for commercial work, I use like you know um, the five DS usually. Okay. And I also, but I also use a Mamiya uh, medium format film camera from the eighties. Oh. I like to fuck around with um, Nashika. Have you ever seen these quadrilateral things? They take four photos at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're uh, they're fun. But yeah, mostly... places, do you have your own uh, black room or do you? No, fuck. I, I didn't study photography. I don't know how to do that. I wish I did. But uh, oh, yeah, so no. do you have to take? Do you have places there that you can at least get stuff printed? Because I know getting like medium format printed here, you know, you got to find a place. Like it's not like you know it's something you can just shoot and get printed. Yeah. No. Yeah. There's places here, but uh, uh, none of them are. Um, I feel like the places in South Africa. are better like South Africa has has a better okay. like photography scene than there is here wow uh, yeah like buying gear anything like you guys have uh, sunshine is it sunshine cinema what? oh I mean yeah they with sunshine cinema I don't they do outdoor cinema oh, things, so, like... that's how I've got the wrong fucking thing here <laughs> okay <laughs> they, see I, I it's so funny how you first start forgetting places names I was trying to remember uh, where I got used to get stuff printed for this print run, and I just I completely blanked. I know there's a place out. I mean, we use the print room for almost perfect. They they are fantastic. Um, although they don't necessarily do like you know film stuff, but they can print anything you need in terms of digital printing, in terms of everything else. But there are they, I know there's a place out in Durban North that used to do like printing or medium formats and stuff like that. Russell Grant used to take his stuff there. I just can't remember the name. <laughs> if yeah. I remember before I do the intro, I'll let people know. Yeah, no, I mean, there's just a lot, uh, like, uh, there's a lot more uh, resources in South Africa, which I, I didn't think would be the case. Wow. There's a couple of really Me cool neither. Places. Like, until you just said that, I was like, it must be so much easier over there. But I just know, because I know it's a hassle for people here. and But, like, it's still at least doable fairly easily if you got a car, I guess. Yeah, like, look, there's a couple of places here uh, that do good work, um, but it's either prohibitively expensive or um, you have to be like a member. Uh, there's a couple of cool spots, though. I don't know. Going to be a member. Yeah, well, like, there's a good. Yeah, I'm not. Don't wanna. Don't wanna see. Don't wanna ruin your chances of getting in the club. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. When I left South Africa, I came back at one point with a friend of mine, an Irish friend, and and I realized how intense I used to be in Durban. 
Like I was like, oh, I can't go in there because I shouted at that man. Uh, I can't go there because I've got beef with that person. I like a, a list of beefs. <laughs> yeah, that's why I need to get out. <laughs> yeah. I've got a list of beefs, but I'm still here. So I'm, I'm much, I'm very conscious of not starting beefs now, you know? Yeah, I'm, I feel you there. I'm, as I'm getting older, I'm just like, you're like, it's so much stress. It's so much unnecessary like time of your life like yeah just wasted worrying about yeah weird interactions with people yeah my friend neil who came to south africa with me he was just like what do you mean like did you used to be a complete cunt like what happened you weren't a complete cunt at all but i was 80 percent. i was 80 percent cunt definitely. But, but weren't we fucking all like I, I do feel like everyone kind of had a chip on their shoulder and rubbed each other the wrong way at some point like it was just young people being drunk with their egos in a creative scene, you know, like, I guess yeah. shit's going to, you're going to disagree with people. You're going to, someone's going to mack on your girl and like, you know, shit's going to get weird. <laughs> Honestly, Bob, I think you hit the, the nail on the head there is egos. Yeah. I, remember, I remember a lot of egos, my own obviously too. Yeah, I just remember thinking that Durban had a lot of egos for a small city. It's amazing, eh? Like, oh my god. It's one of the, the things that, like, I find hilarious about it. But it is, like, I guess, small town mentality in some way. And, it, like, people have a thing to prove. You boys, because yeah. you always, like, yeah, you like, I, I know it's, you know, as a Durbanite. It's like, I always feel that way, like, especially with the rest of the country. And you do feel like other people don't take you as seriously because you're from Durban sometimes. So you've got this insecurity and a chip on your shoulder. And, yeah, that just comes out in it's a terrible way sometimes that's it and man. good ways yeah that's it like ego does no one good except i don't know maybe in the start maybe i don't know if i'd be where i am if i didn't have a bit of an ego at the start it's kind of like but it's something that has to be managed you know yeah um, it can definitely go the wrong way as we've seen yeah definitely yeah but yeah no beefs i love all institutions in all of ireland and dublin Thank you all for doing what you're doing for, for the community. Especially ones that would <laughs> actually have you as a member. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what's, uh, yeah, what's commercial work like these days? Where are you working? What kind of stuff are you working on? I am working, I'm actually uh, working in a, an agency that uh, specializes in connecting brands with um, people, with young people. So it's like a youth agency. Uh, so we uh, specialize in the 16 to 36-ish demographic, depending on, you know, who we're doing the work for, um, which is really cool. I think we have to keep up with trends. Our work always has to be actually cool, not like that Steve Buscemi meme where he's got the skateboard over his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I often use that as a reference point of what we're trying to avoid um so, so when uh, someone submits something whack you're just like you send that gift back yeah exactly yeah <laughs> that, that's not gonna work no we can't make you just go viral uh yeah <laughs> it's really so the work we do is, is is really cool we we have kind of free run for most of it i i'm a creative director there uh, i manage the or i run the film and photography department uh, so i work with a team of really talented people which is great. So, you know, editors, uh, uh, DOPs, directors, photographer, a photographer. And then, uh, yeah, and I, I do a lot of everything now, which is really cool. So uh, in the, I've been working there for five years now. It's a, an agency called Think House. And we do work for anyone from, uh, there's a lot of Irish brands in there, Lifestyle Sports, which is um, like a, a sneaker retailer here. And Heineken, Jameson, we recently started doing the global social for them. Oh, nice. uh, yeah, like it's like beefy enough accounts, you know, um, and and our clients are generally very trusting of us. So but yeah, it, it's kind of it's different from what I used to do in South Africa, obviously. But do you like the level of responsibility and also, I guess, working with a big team? Yeah, initially the team thing was tricky for me. You know, photography, yeah, photography is such a solo thing, <laughs> lone wolf pursuit. Um, yeah, yeah, the the prep and the after, like the only time like photography is not lonely is when you're doing the shoot. Everything else about it is quite a solo process. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's, it's um, it was kind of weird. It was weird at first, but 
they made it really easy for me. I, I actually, I started working there because um, they asked me to just do, when I was freelancing here, they sent me an email, just kind of went, um, we need some imagery for our brand. Uh, and can you do that? And I was like, yeah, but what do you need? It's like, whatever you want, just do it. Here's money. And it was just the best brief <laughs> I've, ever, <laughs> I've ever gotten. Um, that sounds good. That sounds really good. Yeah, so it was like a nice intro, you know, so I did that for them. We had an exhibition there um, the, the office is really beautiful and quite big. We have nice, well, pre-COVID, we used to have parties there. Um, it was really fun. It's like a really brilliant bunch of talented people. Um, so, uh, and then and then I started working there full time because it, it all just worked out so well. I've been there ever since. Uh, the, mm -hmm. Yeah, working with people thing is it can be, you know, I think the ego has to die first, you know, um, but yeah. also it's just made me a lot more, a lot better with working with people, I hope. I'm sure if my team are listening, which I, I doubt they will, but <laughs> if they are, um, uh, I love you all and uh, and I hope you agree um, with the things <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> for me with the ego has to die thing i guess my ego hasn't died enough because i'm always like but that always ego hasn't died yet i'm always like pointing out the other people in my own mind i'm just like, <laughs> no, yeah, that that was, like everyone take up too much time and too much space and like i'm trying to be you know good here and not take it up fuck that guy and i'm just like no dude you got this all wrong still so maybe that's probably why i still do everything on my own Man, if I can dial my cunt down to like 20%, I'm winning. <laughs> From 80 to 20. 80 that's to 20, that's, 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 that's good going, man. That's, that's good going. I, I haven't started any major beefs. So, no, it's, it's very interesting. I like the responsibility. I like the challenge. It's always something else. You know, um, we do everything from smaller social pieces to TV uh, and cinema. And, um, you know, sometimes it's nail biting stuff. And I'm always of the opinion that we should, if we're doing something that we're not, that doesn't scare us, it's not the right path. So we're constantly so pushing ourselves to do the things that are like that, that kind of terrify us, um, which is still, you know, it's the same mentality as what got me yeah. here. Uh, and it's the same thing we keep pushing. Because I was actually going to ask you, you know, like being a creative director now you've been there for five years you know aren't you feeling comfortable but then it seems like through the job you're actually still able to constantly put yourself out of your comfort zone oh man yeah i i also think we're just growing you know as a as a department um like we're just taking on bigger and bigger things so we're not stagnant at all uh which is great yeah so and yeah the work often terrifies me but um that's what that's the sort of thing i like you know yeah i feel you man uh, let's talk a little bit about we can go yeah we can talk a bit about the pub because you're doing you're doing an auction for them right uh, it's it's not an auction it's just selling prints oh just I, straight I, up yeah, selling prints just selling prints man i know everyone's doing it um it's kind of weird it's, it's kind of like the f creatives always step up to try help out it's just like everyone's like yeah can, this is the only thing we can do though you know we can we can give you some prints to sell um, yeah, but like I appreciate that because I mean I like you know I've got some weird feelings about venues opening up and that, but also you don't want venues to close down. So it's like I like this option. I like that you're trying to you know fundraise for a venue that I assume helps shape you. Man, I don't know what it is about that place. <laughs> it is um, it's a special little shithole. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Like it used to be way more grimy than it is now. Uh, that is, yeah. The couches up. You you weren't even around for the couches upstairs, no. man. Well, you you weren't even around the when it wasn't upstairs. So no, I've never been upstairs. No. It's it's been grimier than even when you like were there. That place Experience. used to be, yeah. That place used to be STD on the couch central. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just remember. I remember like the piss uh, on the way to the men's bathroom. Yeah, because it, it used to be like a little dip, and you'd have to jump over it, uh, and like you know, fucking dodge cockroaches. All the people I loved in Durban used to go there. Uh, I have the best memories from that place. You know, somehow, the, especially back in the day, you'd get like a can of Black Label, and it would somehow be flat. <laughs> so I, 
I've just attracted to to grimy shit halls, and I've not found anything similar in Ireland or in Dublin, at least not not to the same level. But uh, I, I, what? Yeah, what are the pubs like there in comparison? Because I don't actually imagine pubs in Ireland to be grimy from my imagination. But I they're, they're don't grimy. Know. They're just in a. It's a different. There's everything. You know, there's the old man pubs. There's the trad pubs where people are doing traditional Irish music. There's the fucking touristy ones in the Temple Bar area, which are still great fun. And um, there's a, it's a mix. There there's trendy ones. There's bars, but. There's loads anyway. There's fucking loads, but nothing quite like the Winston. I think the thing that I loved about the Winston in South Africa is that as much as I love Bern, the Winston catered to absolutely everyone. You'd always go in there. You'd never know what the fuck was going to happen. Could be hip hop night. Could be last time I was in it. There was a satanic ritual with fucking like fake blood, uh, which is great. <laughs> you know, it, like it was dumb. <laughs> but it was it was brilliant yeah, was, was yeah people great. love the I've been there when there's been like jelly wrestling and like yeah. uh, a blow up pool at the back fuck there's yeah. your like all those uh, car, there used to be those cardboard vendors parties where it would be it would have themes like there was like a wrestling theme a WWE yeah. theme you'd never know you know and like you know these were the days of loopy and pure and you know just absolute madness you know, and you'd never get in you could do fucking anything really i think gloopy was the only person i knew that ever got banned um yeah well after yeah after you left i think a few more people got banned because madame luke tried to clean it up a bit but <laughs> fair enough I don't, I don't think people got banned for too long i don't know how, i don't know if anyone's like ever always banned from the winston you know yeah, no, yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like you get a demerit or something, you get to go back later. But um, <laughs> <laughs> what I love about the Winston is is that that real openness. And also, man, like, the Durban doesn't have that many fucking live venues left. Like, yeah. It's not, it's not a city which can afford to lose more of them. And, uh, and, and I know it, it, it was a, such a, a breeding ground for so many young creatives. And it wasn't just the musicians, it was, it was photographers. You know, I remember shooting there with like Samora and Erin, um, Erin Wilson. Oh, yes, Erin Olsen. Yeah, like, and the, it was just, I don't know if it's still like that, but I just remember meeting so many cool people there. And like all my friends would always just, all the creative types would go there and hang out you know yeah um, i think it's not on the same level as it used to be but it's still that for a younger generation you know it's still a place where there's always different things happening and where different groups of you know people can go and conglomerate and yeah you can you can be going there hoping it's a metal night but nope it's a night is <laughs> drum and bass and you yeah. are chilling like you're chilling there in your in your platform fucking boots with your goth gear on with someone else who's got a monster cap on and it's just like it's it's beautiful like in that way like i genuinely those are the nights at the winston where i'm just like yeah this is what it's all about yeah you walk in and there's a cytrons night and there's fucking yep. tie-dye everywhere it's like well yep. should i go home no i'm, I'm here now <laughs> let's see what let's see what happens Oh, man. And there's it's so like, few spaces like, in the world that have that much diversity really like in terms of what they yeah, offer and man. in terms of what they're open to yeah and just the people who go there man like it it was my like burn was my home for a long time i love burn but um like winston was like a really weird punk version of cheers you know <laughs> <laughs> where people would fight sometimes and they'd be so violent piss it was like a pissy version of cheers just a more depressing violent like yeah <laughs> punky <laughs> I mean, the stories I've got from that or that I've heard, too, from people, you know, and all the people I love, love the place. It's kind of like, if you love the Winston, I probably like you. <laughs> fucking Tyron Bradley. You know Tyron Bradley? Of course I fucking know Tyron Bradley. He's I'm also was, checking. <laughs> was he someone who, because he, like, was a little bit above you in the scene. Did he? Did you ever work under him or anything or nah? Man, man, Tyron Bradley is one of the best humans in the world. I'll tell you that much. Uh, yeah, Jono, I can agree there. Jono moved here. Do you know? Yeah, Jono. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He, yes, yes, he yes. moved here recently, and whenever we get together, it's just like fucking. Let's let's just talk about Tyron for like twenty minutes and then we'll move on. 
No, Tyron Bradley, uh, yeah, he when he was working for Red Bull, he got me to, to work, to shoot that with him. That's what uh, I remember, yes. Yeah, and it was like, Tyron Bradley got me a, a lot of paid gigs. And like, I used to I used to think Tyron Bradley was a god. He was always in fucking blunt as a, as a BMXer, you know? Mm-hmm. Actually, he was, that was the thing, he was in front of the camera, like Liam was shooting him. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> yeah, and he was just like, you know, as, as a, a little goth with a lot of ego, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, d- and drinking a whole lot. I just remember when I met him at, I think it was at Art Space, at an exhibition, one of those group exhibitions they used to have, and I was like absolutely like nervous to talk to this man. And then, yeah, he's one of my best friends now. But he, he's actually got, uh, he's got bar troll, bar troll tattooed on his inner lip. Um, <laughs> because one night they were like sitting on the sleeper under the bar in the Winston. And then just like stealing drinks from the bar, I think that was the, that was the thing. I don't know. Anyone who I love, loves the Winston. Anyone in South Africa. Uh, I will say the last time, like when Matt and Luke took over the Winston, I like volunteered to bartend once or twice, and someone stole the fucking tip jar. So like, I was like, I'm done. That was it. Yeah, I was like, I'm I'm cool. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, like, look, it's a small thing, really. You know, it's we're not we're not expecting to make a huge amount of money, but they're still not allowed to open. Um, because they're technically a nightclub, not a pub or a bar. Um, yeah, because of the so, whole building's license. Exactly. Uh, so it's just a small thing. Um, we're just selling prints. They're limited to 10 each. They're uh, five of my favorite images that I've ever taken at the Winston. I went back through the archives for like a week just trying to sift through it. There were so many good memories in that well, yeah what was that experience like man oh it was it was kind of like yeah it was very so much nostalgia you know fucking mm-hmm. like i remember it. there's there were images from a beyond the pale gig where nick croon was still in the brand band and it just like all the fucking carboot vendor gigs all the sibling gigs all the fruits and veggies gigs uh some of the people who who aren't with us anymore yeah, like it, it just, it was, it just smacked of things that are gone now in many ways. Yeah. But yeah, so it was, it was a really kind of cathartic experience to go through that stuff again. But yeah, it, I think there's some, there's some cool shots in there and we're printing to request so um, people can choose what size they want. Otherwise, uh, you're left oh, with right. A1s in your fucking, <laughs> in your house. A1. Oh, no. Shit that you don't need, you know. Yeah, you uh, also like printing big fucking photos. I, I know do. That about you. <laughs> like I remember, I won't say what we we're doing, but I, I remember one of your photos being used for various things, and yeah, it, it played the played the role it needed to quite nicely because it was fucking big. There was a lot of glass needed there. Like there was a lot of glass for what was needed. <laughs> Are you saying that it was a surface that was non-porous? Uh, I'm going in that direct, general and direction. Of what I'm okay, saying. yeah, that's happened some <laughs> times. <laughs> yeah, like I, I just I've got memories of that. Like, yeah, I'll just um, say it. Fuck it, doing cocaine off of one of your photos and like just your <laughs> photos being fucking big. <laughs> like, man, that's happened in Dublin. I've 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 seen that happen in Dublin. <laughs> what someone do coke off you one of your photos yeah yeah i had a little exhibition here and i was like oh wow this is uh it, yeah home sweet home like that home must have been like i feel oh this is my place these are my people <laughs> it's you know it just made me feel like uh, i obviously attract a certain type <laughs> <laughs> i yeah. mean it's probably all the photos of dicks you know yeah well this is it yeah i did uh, I did some pictures, some more dick pics. Uh, <laughs> in, Why in, do you uh, like taking pics of dicks, Kevin Ghost Ross? And they're just so funny. Like, <laughs> I mean, they're just we're we're a ridiculous gender. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best answer to that question. <laughs> we are a ridiculous bunch of fucking men. You know, I don't know. It's just it's usually also it's just when people are really drunk. I think the dick started just. I I like. I like, uh, especially at festival, I don't know, I used to do these a series called, uh, like I used to call them festival portraits. 
yeah where i'd go to a, a festival with a softbox yes yeah, so that was it that's why i remember you carrying around lights oh really okay yeah yeah that was it yeah um I did that first time in like 2010. Uh, drove down to Opikopi um, with Aaron and my brother, and uh, and did and did these portraits. And it was the first time I think it had been done in Opie. It was really cool. But the whole the whole plan there was to you know to find to find that real like festival fatigue where someone had you know <laughs> when you're on the third day of a festival and you hadn't slept and like you're and you've just been doing ketamine and yeah yeah and just finding those fucking creatures you know. That was always what I was looking for, and generally those people uh, are maybe a little bit more interested in taking off their clothes. Like I never ask them to. I never go, "Hey, can I take a picture of your dick?" Like that never happens. It, They're like, "Take a picture of my dick." It's, yeah, <laughs> this is it. Yeah, I remember one point someone on Mahala actually commented on one on one of the articles. It's like, "Yeah, well, there you go, Kevin Goss Ross again, fucking doing his normal thing." Uh, pictures of drunk people in cocks. I was like, yeah, well, okay, fine, fuck. Yeah, grand. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, you've got a style, you've got a gimmick. Like, you know, all the greats have got the things that they're known for. <laughs> Mine is just male genitalia. Sweet. <laughs> it's a good genre to be in, especially as a guy, you know, like that makes it an interesting dynamic. It's got it's got its it says its own things within that, you know, about masculinity and everything. Like I do think there is value in that. Like from a dude taking photos of other dudes' dicks and not shying away from it and not being like a sexual thing or you know, uh, even a statement on homosexuality or non homosexuality, it just being what it is. Like I think it's really fucking cool. I think, you know, I think there's a lot of photographers <laughs> who get into it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, to take photos you know, of titties. Yeah, there's a lot of them. So it's kind of like the antithesis of that. <laughs> I was going to see more dick, which is not something I necessarily want to see, but here we go. <laughs> when you started out your photography career, you were like, I'm going to take a hundred photos of dicks at least. <laughs> <laughs> I should do an exhibition of that. I mean, I'm surprised you have it already, to be honest. Ah, uh, listen, I'm trying to get away from that. Let's not talk about dicks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to head towards? Because you're, you're, you're doing a pretty, yeah, you, your career seems pretty set. So are there any other goals and ambitions that you've got underlying there um, that aren't going to get you fired from your job for admitting? <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, look, I think, I think what I really enjoy uh, is shooting work and exhibiting it. Um, and that's not something I've done in a long time. I think one of my favorite things I've ever done was right before I left Durban, we had that exhibition in, uh, in what was it? Factory Cafe. It's Factory Cafe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the one with about India, between Cha. Between life and, death and life Cha. And life life and, and death Cha. between Cha, yeah. Yes, a that was title. it. title, yeah. <laughs> also, fucking huge prints. Um, yeah. That was so dope, though. Like, that was, and that's the thing, that was a memorable night. And I think because of the scale and scope and size of the prints, and like, yeah, the three of you guys did a great job and had, you know, completely different styles, completely different perspectives. And I remember there were a couple hundred people there. Yeah, it was, yeah, I was worried because there were too many. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a, a yeah, fucking not, not a problem you usually have in Durban for art no. exhibitions. <laughs> No, also because we had our shit like strung up with fishing wire. And I was just like, this is, <laughs> someone's going to start knocking this shit down. It's all going to come down like a fucking house of cards. But, um, you know, it was, I love that because like you can put an image on the internet, on social media and, you know, people like it, whatever. But there's nothing better than putting it somewhere and kind of being able to be just be there and watch people react to what you've put up and kind of, it's kind of creepy actually, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of, you're just fucking hovering. Aren't you a little voyeuristic anyway? Oh, well, yeah, of course. Who isn't? Yeah, I wish photographer isn't. But I just, I love that. It's kind of, it's kind of brutal sometimes, you know, like you put something up <laughs> and then you can, you stand there and someone just goes like, yeah, it's all kind of looks a bit samey. <laughs> and it's like, cool. And then two minutes later, someone just goes, oh, this is really cool. And, so I, I love that part of photography, but um, and it's certainly something I am looking to get back into, you know, photography for the sake of it. I don't do that much photography in my day to day. So at the end of the day, I do still have a drive to 
you know, to create photography. But I've been kind of lazy. And also, I've just been dealing with like fucking visa and immigration bullshit uh, for. We're also in the middle of a pandemic, so the, well, you know. Yeah, well. For now, like you can you can use the excuse for the last six months. You can be like ah. But yeah, that's definitely something I'd like to I like to do a lot more of. Um, yeah, because I haven't seen like too many photos from you since you left, so I would definitely love to see more of your work. I mean, you've definitely been one of my favorite photographers, like in South Africa. And ah. I love your work. I love Tyron's work as well, Liam's work. I think we've got pr pretty similar, like, you know, taste in a way. Like, I think, yeah, the people who you admire, I admire. And I also obviously admire you and your work. So, ah, that's yeah, man, I want to see more of it. Uh, like, there are a couple of things, a, lo a couple of projects that 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 have been started. But um, myself and Tyron Bradley started a project God knows how long ago now. Shit, it must be 20, 2016, 2015, where we just got into his car and drove around the Karoo and um, went into little towns. And then we'd go into the town. We'd go, who's the weirdest person in the town? Oh, my God. And then we'd go to their house and then, like, make friends with them and then take pictures of them. And we did that for, like, fuck, it was like a week. <laughs> It was absolutely... Those are just on a hard drive somewhere. Yeah, no, like, they, yeah, they're just on my hard drive. But, like, we, it was such a wonderful thing because it was amazing. It was just, it reinvigorated my love for, like, humans because, you know, you meet these people and they, like, invite you to stay with them. But then myself and Tyron were doing it as an experiment in extreme collaboration where, because photography is such a lone wolf pursuit, we would just take pictures with either camera it didn't matter who pressed the shutter because we we're working as a complete team so whether i was holding the camera or him doesn't matter uh, there was a rule that if if he had an idea for something no matter what we did it if i had an idea for something we did it like i remember like 3 a.m tyron bradley waking up and going do you know what i want to go take pictures of that weird fucking succulents out in the desert and i was like fuck you dude honestly just <laughs> go back to sleep but you can't sleep go do it and also like we started editing some of it and the idea was like i i edit the image the way i like it and then he edits yeah. it the way he likes it and then we just overlay them 50 50 percent you know that's so be fucking interesting sheesh it's in you think it's interesting right but it could also just be a mess well, the weird thing that happens is I like really warm tones, like yellows and reds, and Tyron's more mm. like a, you know, Blues. colder sometimes, you know. Yeah. And so what happens is he he spends, he edits really quickly. I spend more time in post than him. And, and, and he'll do his thing, I'll do my thing. I'll spend like an hour on an image, two hours on a fucking image, you know, and then... Do you disqualify each other? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Just go back to the start. <laughs> like, hours of work for fuck all <laughs> oh, that then, is funny what, what that is funny happening. what started happening then was that like, i was like i just go more yellow so you know i get my way and then he just i think he was doing the same thing like just going more his way and it's like and it just takes way longer to edit but basically we took a lot of really cool stuff there and there's one image that we shot that is definitely the best thing i've done in a very long time and we just both decided that there wasn't enough work to to make it a, a full thing. So we were meant to finish it this year, but you know, the coronavirus. Coronavirus, yeah. But yeah, when that eventually gets finished, I'd be very happy. The last big thing I did was the mile in Durban. The pictures on yeah, the. I remember beach. that. We published that on Durban is yours. <laughs> yeah, R.I.P. Which means it can't be found anymore. <laughs> I, will, I will put the site back up probably next year. Uh, like, yeah, I've got it on a hard drive somewhere. I've got all of that stuff still. Oh, I, I, did, I did back it up. Yeah, no. Okay. So it's also, it's just like, we got we to gotta wait for all the cancellations to, to die down a little bit <laughs> before no, I can put that like, website back up. The work cancellations? No, like cancellations in terms of uh, people. Oh, because there, there were some things said by some people on that website. Uh, that... Oh yeah, yeah. Well, well, uh, someone's always going to be pissed off. 
Yeah, and it was also a product of its time and blah, 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 and all those things. Yeah, but so. like, who gives a shit? I, honestly, sometimes, I don't know. Look, I just think, I just thought that was such a good resource for Durbin. I don't know why the fuck you kept doing it either. I just remember going like... At this point, at, at one point to go to that, it was like, I don't know why the fuck I'm still doing this. <laughs> like, I, it, it did. It was just like, yeah, no, this, this isn't good for you. Like, this is destroying you. And that's why yeah. I eventually stopped it. I mean, like, like I was do- I was doing the odd freebie, but like it was nothing compared to what you guys were doing. Yeah, like the problem is I'm I'm good at creating things. I'm just not necessarily that good at the negotiating table, you know, at getting advertisers in and those sorts of things. Yeah. And that's why, like, I love this like podcasting and stuff because we've got Patreon, we've got crowdfunding and stuff like that, and it being a listener supported thing makes it so fucking cool like it was the one thing i wish we could have really done with durban is yours is make it more funded by the people who used it you know the people yeah. who had benefited and stuff like that and i'm thankful like with this that i actually am able to do that and yeah i'm very very grateful for the income i get on this because it's way more than i got from durban is yours and i did that <laughs> for way longer so and the weird thing is it's not even that much Oh, well, yeah, it, it was, it's kind of, it's one of those things that you you kind of do for the love of it. And then after a while, exactly. you just realize it's a very abusive relationship. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, the amount of time I put into doing, like, doing things for musicians in Durban for free. And I absolutely mm-hmm. fucking loved it 90% of the time. But it's, uh, sometimes it got thrown back in your face. Like, sometimes you regretted, like, working with someone or, like... Yeah, like like you said earlier, the egos thing, I 100% agree with. Durban has had a bit of an issue with that for such a small yeah. town. Yeah, also just, I mean, working with musicians. Like, okay, one thing that I do enjoy with, as a cultural thing in Ireland, is generally compared to Durban, everyone's on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Durban time is like a, truly a thing. Fuck me. Oh, and like, and people just not showing up for shoots. And <laughs> band members getting thrown out literally as we're doing the shoot. And <laughs> what do you mean? Like, a, did a band break up whilst you were shooting them? A, a band got rid of a member once mid shoot. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> sweet. Okay. Well, fuck. So this is going nowhere. <laughs> uh, that is, oh, you should have sold that story, dude. Like, damn, that would have. Wow, oh, fuck. Up. I once did I once did pictures for fruits and veggies and I I was like look I'm not gonna do a picture of all of you together because it's there's no fucking point it, yeah so let's just do each person separately and we'll find a way to stick you all together because it's like while again while we were doing it I think someone joined the band it was when Cam joined the band and I was just like oh cool so, <laughs> so I'll just I'll do another <laughs> but yeah that's 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 one good thing um about Irish culture and one thing that I don't miss about Durban although there's a lot to miss it's a fucking yeah city that's the thing it's got it's it both like it's the thing that you hate is the thing that you love you know like the the people being late is because they're so chilled and so laid back and like it's the the thing you know you love people in Durban because you they're chilled and laid back but that comes with the yeah, that <laughs> that negative side, like the other side of the coin is just like, yeah. well, fuck, I'm going to have to wait here for an hour. <laughs> Constantly. I was back in 2017 because I had a, a problem with immigration here uh, and I had to go back. I had to leave the country to let my current visa expire and then apply again from South Africa. And I didn't know how long I was going to be home and I was home for three months. Oh, my God. It was fucking brilliant. I nearly didn't come back. I absolutely adore Durban. It's amazing. It's kind well, of. I think that's... Yeah. Sorry, what were you gonna say though? No, it's 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 a weird thing. I I definitely I definitely miss the place. Uh, and I'll be back soon for some courts in the pub. Yeah, it'll be wonderful to be able to share some beers with you, and we don't have to necessarily be socially distant. It'll so be, we can we fucking can, make out. It'll be nice to hug. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, we can make out again. Have we made out? I'm pretty sure know. I've made out with you. I yeah, we've probably made out. <laughs> we we were both people who made out with other people a lot. So <laughs> 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 there was that. That's also a thing that's hard to like explain. Is that all the dudes in the punk scene just made out with each other a lot, like back in the yeah. day? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, I mean like obviously not great right now, 
but uh, <laughs> no, it's not, not not a behavior we would encourage necessarily right now. But once the vaccine's out, dudes kiss oh, kiss each other. Fucking, let's get in. <laughs> get to someone what? else. And that is where we're going to end this podcast. <laughs> Bro, thank you so fucking much. This was so fun. Like I've laughed yeah. and fucking like really had like the best fucking time like on the side here. So thank you so much, oh, man. Me too, man. It, it's like a trip down memory lane again. Yeah, uh, I like feel like I really, really fucking good. needed this. <laughs> yeah, me too. I feel like a, a real connection back to Durban. Uh, and yeah, like I'm absolutely dying to get back for a bit. Yeah, well, looking forward looking to forward. seeing you again, bro. You too.